with historical evidence combined with common sense. Take, for example, the central premise of the Oxfordian or Baconian case that the plays must have been written by an aristocrat, or at least by one with a university education, on the assumption that Shakespeare, as a commoner, with a universe without a university education, must have been illiterate, or at any rate, incapable of writing literature of such sublime quality. One of the key things. Only an aristocrat could have been as sublime as Shakespeare. Shakespeare was an aristocrat, aristocrat, ipso facto, Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare. Let's look at the facts. Shakespeare's father was not poor, but on the contrary, was relatively wealthy. He was, furthermore, a highly respected and influential member of the Stratford upon Avon community. With regard to Shakespeare's education, the historian Michael Wood has shown that the sort of education that Shakespeare would have received at the Stratford Grammar School would have been of exceptionally good quality. He built that up by looking at um, the plays and sonnets do not display the great knowledge of classical languages, which one might have expected if Shakespeare had been an aristocrat, or like Bacon, he had been to Oxford or Cambridge. Francis Bacon did much of his writing in Latin, whereas Shakespeare, to quote his good friend Ben Johnson, had little Latin and less Greek, although I said that's relative to then. Pretty, uh, to, with today, he's got a good classic education, and wrote entirely in the vernacular. The evidence illustrates, therefore, that William Shakespeare would have, been ha would have had a good education, but that he might not have been as comfortable with classical languages as he would have been had he been to Oxford or Cambridge. This excellent but non-classical education is reflected in the content of his plays. It should also be noted that Francis Bacon was vehemently anti-Catholic. His mother was a zealous Calvinist, and his father an outspoken enemy of the Catholic Church. Such an upbringing would have been precluded from, his, from him from being able to write the family Catholic plays attributed to Shakespeare. That's a non-sequitur. I'm confessing it myself because I'm not arguing from the texts here. As for the presumption of the Oxfordians and Baconians that Shakespeare's humble origins would have precluded him from being able to write the plays, one need only rem remember uh, that great literature is not the preserve of the rich or the privileged. Christopher Marlowe was a shoemaker's son, and Ben Johnson's stepfather was a bricklayer. Poverty prevented Johnson from pursuing a university education. Since Marlowe and Johnson, along with Shakespeare, are the most important dramatists of the Elizabethan and Jacobean period, it is clear that having humble origins did not disqualify a writer from producing great literature. On the contrary, it could be argued from the evidence that such origins were an important ingredient of literary greatness in Shakespeare's day. Um, and again, I then quote later generations. Daniel Defoe was the son of a butcher. Samuel Johnson, arguably the greatest wit and literary figure of the 18th century, was also born of poor parents. Poverty would force Johnson to abandon his university education. Charles Dickens, the greatest novelist of the Victorian era, experienced riding poverty as a child, and when his father was sent to prison for debt, the 10-year-old Dickens was forced to work in a factory. Moving into the 20th century, G.K. Chesterton, the Dr. Johnson of his age, was born of middle-class parents and never received a university education. Okay, so one of the first major pillars upon which they build their edifice is that a poor, humble, uh, non-aristocrat could not have written these sublime plays and poems. That's clearly nonsense. Um, so much for the weakness of the Oxfordian argument about Shakespeare's humble origins. The other argument often employed by the Oxfordians is that Shakespeare was too young to have written the sonnets in the early plays. Shakespeare was only in his mid-twenties when the earliest of the plays was written, and was in his late twenties when he wrote the sonnets. There's no way that such a young man could have written such work, whereas the Earl of Oxford, being born in 1550, and therefore, 14 years Shakespeare senior would have been sufficiently mature to have written these masterpieces. So the argument runs. Whether the Earl of Oxford, a most violent and volatile individual, was ever sufficiently mature to have written the works of Shakespeare is itself highly questionable. Nonetheless, let's look at the crux of the matter, namely whether a young man is able to write great literature. So uh, I'm going to try to skim some of this because of the time issue. But Christopher Marlowe was only 23, two or three y years younger than Shakespeare. He's thought to have been when he f wrote the first of his plays when the first of Marlowe's plays was produced. Um, and it's generally considered to be the first of the great Elizabethan tragedies. He was 23 years old. Ben Jonson's first play was performed in 1598 with Shakespeare in the cast when Jonson was only 26 years old. Thomas Decker, these are obviously Shakespeare's contemporaries, published the first of his comedies when he was around 30 years old. Thomas Middleton uh, was about 32. John Webster was 27. Uh, Ma uh, um, John Marston was between the ages of 26 and 31. So looking at his contemporary, Shakespeare was at exactly the age one would expect him to be when he first started writing plays. The early Earl of Oxford, on the other hand, would have been around 40 when the plays, first of the plays was performed, making him a positive geriatric by comparison. <laughs> and then so much for the youthfulness of the playwright Shakespeare, what about the sonneteer, the writer of the sonnets? Looking at his, at his contemporaries, Michael Drayton published his first volume of poetry when he was 28 years old. John Donne was in his late 20s or early 30s. Uh, Sir Philip Sidney was only 32 when he died, Robert Southall was 33 when he died, and Christopher Marlowe was 29, and Thomas Nash was 34. All of these have led, left us with a great body of uh, extremely good poetry. Samuel Johnson, moving on, to the 18th century, was 28 when he uh, finished his play Irene, and a year older when he finished London, his poem. 
And as for Alexander Pope, he published his first poems at the tender age of 21. And then, we could carry on, we will briously. Byron, Shelley, and Keats. I'll say no more, really. Byron was 36 when he died, Shelley was 30, and Keats a mere 26 years old. As for the precocious talent of the youngest of the youthful trio, Keats is said to have written some of the finest sonnets in as little as 15 minutes. And Keats never even lived to the age at which Shakespeare is thought to have written his own sonnets. Okay. There are other things we could say here. The fact that um, his illiteracy is proved by the fact he's got a very shaky signature. Department of Arvind University. Um, they're not my present projecting our own presence in the audience today that his uh, own article on the Phoenix and the Turtle was one of these significant pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And you, you get one and another and another, and then at a certain point, a threshold is reached. And you think, well, hold on for a second. You know, there's quite a lot here. And at that point, I decided to start researching it myself. And that was, I suppose, the genesis of this book, eventually, when I read more and just thought, well, you know, there's so much here that it needs, to be, it needs to be researched and told. So, I'm now going to sort of try to go through the chapters of my book, but using about three sentences from each as we move on. So, apart from the first chapter, which is called Will the Real Shakespeare Please Stand Up, which talks about um, the importance of Shakespeare, and um, a spiritual will and testament was discovered in the, uh, hidden in the roof, in the, in the eaves of the roof of the Shakespeare family home in Henley Street, in Stratford upon Avon. And it was the spiritual last and testament of John Shakespeare. And again, you know, there was, at the time, absolutely the main Shakespeare scholar of the time said this is definitely genuine. There was a period of time when people thought it was a forgery, and now, it, uh, there's, uh, my understanding is the vast majority of scholars accept that it was genuine. So, what is the spiritual will and testament? It's basically saying that I, John Shakespeare, want it to be known that I'm dying a Catholic. And he lists about 12 or 14 uh, things that he's making perfectly clear that he believes in. It's like going through the creed. Including things that I want to make it known that I want to have a priest when I die. And if, this, if I can't have a priest when I die, I want it to be known that there was a desire for a priest. Now, what is this like, spiritual will and testament? It's an odd thing. And a Jesuit scholar, early in the 20th century, discovered in Spain, and I think in the, another one in the Romance dialect, dialect in Switzerland, and another one in Spanish from Mexico, the exact same wording, but signed by different people. So, what on earth is this one about? Different parts of the world. And it was traced back that this was a will that was composed by St. Charles Borromeo, who was a contemporary of Shakespeare and the Bishop of Milan. And there was a major plague in Milan. 17,000 people were killed. And it was impossible for the priests to give the last rites to everybody, people dying at this rate. There weren't enough priests. So St. Charles Borromeo issued this spiritual last will and testament around Milan for people to sign in case there was no priest for them in extremis in their dying moments. We know, because we have documentary records, that St. Edmund Campion and several other delegations of priests on their way from the English College in Rome to come back to England as missionary priests, probably facing death, that they stayed with St. Charles Borromeo, obviously just Bishop Borromeo at that time, um, in Milan. And he preached to them, and they were very impressed by him. We have correspondence from priests in England to Rome asking for more copies of the Testaments. And this, it's been said, well, maybe these are the New Testaments, the new Douay, the new Douay um, translation of the New Testament. First of all, the timing doesn't work, because they weren't actually published until the year after these letters. You can't have more of them if they haven't even been published yet. And secondly, we have to remember that these priests were hunted. They were hunted like dogs. Now, uh, this spiritual will and testament is a few pages. and doesn't cost much money. You can secrete those and, and carry them around the country with you. You can't carry around boxes and boxes of uh, you know, Catholic New Testaments even if you can get them into the country. So it's basically accepted now that what John Shakespeare had was one of these uh, spiritual wills of St. Charles Borromeo. Why would they be brought to England? For the same reason as they were needed in Milan. It's not a plague, at least not a physical plague, it's a spiritual plague. But English Catholics, because of the fact that priests were illegal, may well die and have no priest. So this, they're signing them for exactly the same reason as the people in Milan were signing them. So this is obviously solid evidence for John Shakespeare, Shakespeare's father's um, Catholicism. Shakespeare's mother's side, the Arden family, is connected to all the major Catholic plots, in inverted commas, of the uh, Tudor period and the Jacobean period afterwards. The family is one of the most resolutely Catholic families there is. So basically, the evidence is overwhelming that Shakespeare was brought up in a militantly Catholic home. Let me say as well at the moment, there were three types of Catholics in England. There were the church conformists, or the Catholic conformists, who basically were Catholic, they wanted to return to the Catholic faith, but didn't want blind Catholics, if you like, who refused to attend the Anglican services and were, were, suffered the fines. Shakespeare's father, John Shakespeare, was a reticent Catholic. He appears in 1592 on the reticent rolls. Now, evidence against that would be that he was involved, because he was basically one of the major civil officers of Stratford Council, um, in the destruction of the religious images in the Guildhall Chapel. Would a Catholic have taken part in that? Again, you have to, this is the trouble, trying to explain these subtleties of all this. In Protestant parts of the country, religious images were destroyed. They were mutilated. They were, they were, swords were splashed over them. They were pulled down and what have you. And it was done as soon as the law told them to do it. 1559, I think, the law was passed. In Catholic parts of the country, they ignored the law. They didn't carry it out. So there was a delay. In Stratford upon avon there was a visitation by the Anglican bishop and the town councillors, of whom uh, John Shakespeare was one, were ordered because of the law of the country to destroy the religious imagery, images in the, in the chapel. And what they did was to whitewash over them. 
They had to do that or else they would have gone to prison. But they didn't destroy them. The fact that it took five years when they ignored the law and a bishop's visitation to order them to do it, and then they whitewashed over them, painted over them rather than destroyed them, actually indicates their reluctance in carrying it out. And in his spiritual testament, there's a rather uh, resonant one where he confesses and apologizes for times when he's not been true to the church. Okay. There's a chapter in my book called A Rose by Any Other Name. It's a slight paraphrase of, uh, obviously, a line. And ultimately, it's not all that important to the history. Okay, and then Shakespeare comes to London. There's lost years where he gets married and everything else. Obviously, we don't have uh, the whole day here. And he comes to London. The one thing we do know about Shakespeare is he has to leave in a hurry. He's hounded out of Stratford upon Avon by Sir Thomas L- Percy. Sorry, Sir Thomas Lucy, the, um, the uh, local lord of the manor, if you like. Now, Sir Thomas Lucy, Sir Thomas Lucy uh, is a uh, militant, anti-Catholic Puritan who uh, uh, carries out the persecution of Catholics with great relish. And there's all sorts of legends about the fact that Lucy and uh, Shakespeare wrote his first poem attacking Lucy, and Lucy was so outraged that he was, uh, had him whipped and everything else. We don't know how much of that is true, but we do know that Sir Thomas Lucy forced Shakespeare to leave Stafford upon Avon in a hurry, and we do know Sir Thomas Lucy was militantly anti-Catholic. Okay, now, thus far, actually, not all that controversial, because now many, many secular scholars, in the last five or ten years, he becomes a good proto-secularist like the rest of us, <laughs> which conveniently for them is about the time he starts writing his plays in London. Okay, there's an, an awful lot of evidence that Shakespeare knew Sir Robert Suttle, the Jesuit, who was arrested in 1592 and put to death in 1595. We know it from various from, um, allusions and dedications in Sir Robert Suttle's writing, one uh, to Mr. W.S. Uh, we know it from the fact that the Earl of Southampton, who was also at this time a militant Catholic, um, were, Sir Robert Suttle was, we know basically this evidence from confessions under torture from Catholics, that uh, Sir Robert Suttle was the Earl of Southampton's confessor the Earl of Southampton, of course, was Shakespeare's patron. So I, I personally think from that, from parallels in the writing, from the fact that Shakespeare responds in his poem, The Rape of Lucrece, to St. Robert Southall's request that he, he writes something more spiritual, uh, I think not only do the two know of each other, I think that there's the strong evidence they, they knew each other. Not least because St. Robert Southall was serving the Catholics of London, and there weren't that many Catholics in London, relatively speaking. Basically, in England, the further you got from London, the more Catholic it became. Quite simply because in those days it was difficult to enforce. It wasn't like you know, modern technology where you can pass a law and, and, and vigorously enforce it everywhere at the same time. The further you got from, from the centres of government power, the less you could police the laws. Um, there's also, my, my thesis is not that Shakespeare kept his Catholicism secret, but that his Catholicism was known to Queen Elizabeth and known to others, and basically he was a safe Catholic. In other words, one who wasn't going to start stirring up sedition against the crown, which means that obviously his Catholicism in his work is subtle. The reason I give this is the example of William Byrd, who, if you like, William Byrd is the preeminent musician in Elizabethan England, a contemporary of Shakespeare, where Shakespeare is the, the uh, preeminent writer, William Byrd is the preeminent composer. William Byrd was known to be a reticent Catholic, in other words, a strong, defiant Catholic. He and his wife were actually dragged before the courts on two occasions. And the Attorney General, the Queen's Attorney, Attorney General, in other words, on the orders of the Queen, quashed the case. Queen Elizabeth had favourites, and her favourites she would turn a blind eye to. And I think that Shakespeare's Catholicism was considered to be a safe Catholicism, as um, William Byrd was considered to be a safe Catholicism. William Byrd wrote masses. Um, at the same time, he wrote music for the established church. Okay, so we have this, playing safe with the queen, the chapter's called. Walking the tightrope. And how that, the tension of trying to remain a Catholic and trying to remain in the queen's good favour is one of the tensions we see in Shakespeare's uh, plays. In 1606, Susanna Shakespeare, Shakespeare's daughter, is listed as a recusant. Shakespeare does not, Shakespeare's not listed as a recusant anywhere, as far as anybody's discovered, but he never went to the Anglican church. And of course, the secularists say... This proves he's a good non-believer like us. But Shakespeare's father never went to the Anglican church either. Nor did his mother. Nor did his daughter, who was on the record list in 1606. Isn't it far more logical to assume that Shakespeare didn't go to the Anglican church for the same reason that his parents didn't, and the same reason that his daughter didn't, than to assume he's an, uh, a 21st century secular fundamentalist. <laughs> Controversy, huh? And the other, if you look at the history of things, the Catholics were waiting for Queen Elizabeth to die. She lived on and lived on and lived on. And they thought when King James came to the throne, things would be easier. King James was married to a Catholic. His mother was Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic, of course, and beheaded for her Catholicism amongst other things. Um, so that when, when Queen Elizabeth dies, first of all, Shakespeare writes nothing by way of a eulogy of her, so much so that another poet accuses him of an ominous silence on the subject. But actually his plays at the time 
measure for measure and all's well that ends well, have this great liberated feel about them. They're the place that he writes about the time that Elizabeth dies and James I comes to the throne. James tries to go easy on the Catholics, and by this time the power of Parliament, which is under the control of the Puritans, is so powerful, King James can do nothing to alleviate uh, the plight of Catholics. I have no time to talk about the gunpowder plot, but I will do if someone wants to ask me a question on it. So what happens, of course, is that there's another clampdown on Catholics, and this really does lead to desolation. Because you can imagine the psychology of it. You've waited for um, nearly 50 years, for 45 years, for Queen Elizabeth to go away. She eventually goes away. There's a great sense of liberation for about 18 months. And then there's another clampdown. And that's why you get, at this stage, many Catholics finally caving in and, and, and conforming. And other Catholics, the militant ones, deciding to turn to terrorism, the gunpowder plot. And something of this desolation, almost despair, is seen in the plays that come immediately after Measure for Measure and All's Well that Ends Well, after this clampdown. The darkest plays Shakespeare wrote, perhaps. King Lear, Othello, Macbeth. And then the final thing that Shakespeare does before he leaves London is to buy the Blackfriars Gatehouse. Huge house. And what's the significance of that? Well, as the name would suggest, it was originally part of the Dominican Priory in London. It was obviously dissolved by Henry VIII. But it had always remained in Catholic hands. And there's all sorts of documentation, which I quote in my book, to show that it was a, basically a hub of reticent activity in London. It had secret passages leading down to the Thames, the river, so that priests could get away. It had priest's holes, you know, secret places where priests could hide if the house was, was uh, raided. The house was raided. We have reports of that, all of which I cover in my book. And this place that we know was used as a hub from right back to the 1580s when Shakespeare arrived in London and was still being used uh, at the time he left. And he buys that place. Why does he buy that place? Again, the secular scholars say it was an investment. I said, yes, it was an investment. It was a spiritual investment. Because he wanted to make sure it stayed in safe hands. The person who was a tenant there, John Robinson, before he bought it, remained as a tenant after he bought it. John Robinson's brother, in 1613, the year in which Shakespeare buys that house, goes off to Rome to study for the priesthood. Four years after Shakespeare's death, a secret room at the top, the floor collapses, killing quite a few people while a mass is going on. So it's used for clandestine activities, clearly including mass, from the time Shakespeare arrived in London, when he, was, when he bought the house, and was still being used four years after he died for the same purposes, as a hub of Catholic activity. When he dies... If you look at the names of the people on his will, the vast majority of people on his will are local militant Catholics in Stratford-upon-Avon. So he goes back and mixes with the same Catholic families that he'd mixed with when he was young. And the only one of his London connections who's with him in the final days of his life and who signs his will is John Robinson, the brother of the priest who was the tenant in the Blackfriars Gatehouse. 